The launch of the 3DO was an incredibly exciting time in gaming for me. The 16-bit machines had been around for four years by this point in the US, and the fifth generation promised technology and multimedia features well beyond what we were used to. It was not an easy generation to be an early adopter, however. The $700 price point the 3DO launched with was a sobering reminder that even though I had a full-time job, I was gonna have to wait to actually own one. That was okay though, because the 3DO launched with one friggin' game, the Combat Racer Crash and Burn, which was packaged in with the Panasonic hardware. Months would pass before we started seeing some real heavy hitters, so I was actually pretty happy to give that launch some breathing room. Once I did finally have a 3DO to call my own, Crash and Burn was of course my very first game. I had seen the pics and reviews in the gaming magazines already, and I was giddy with excitement to finally play it. What followed was one of my first experiences with a textured mapped home game that I'll never forget. Sure, Crash and Burn was far from the killer app the 3DO needed to sell at its astonishingly high asking price, but I still couldn't help but be impressed. It was the early days of the mainstream 3D polygon era at home, and this was my very first taste of it. Crash and Burn was developed by Crystal Dynamics, the company that would also release Total Eclipse, Gex, The Horde, and Offworld Interceptor during the 3DO's lifetime. It also happens to be the first game Mark Cerny would program after he left Sega behind. Set in a desolate future where combat racing is the only sport that matters, you choose one of six of the best racers in the business. These guys each have their own cars and attributes, ranging from fast and fragile to slow and sturdy. The gameplay here is pretty simple. You race around roller coaster style tracks with the simple aim of surviving. That's easier said than done because you have a group of lunatics and drones out to make things difficult. You do have access to a load of weapons like machine guns, missiles, and landmines to aid you in your quest to become champion. There are two modes of play to choose from. The first is the rally mode, which is just a fancy way of saying arcade mode. Here you get to choose one of five circuits to compete in, earning points in each race. Should you have the most points in the end, you are crowned the champion. If you want a little more meat to your gameplay, you can choose the tournament mode, which allows you to win money and upgrade your car and weapons before each race. The better you do, the more money you get, thus allowing you to really load up on the powerhouse options. When you start out, you have pea shooters that barely scratch your opponent's paint, but by the end, you'll have stuff that sends them packing in seconds. Along with the other racers, you'll also face drones that are there for no other reason than to get in the way. The track design offers some speedy thrills with road hazards like water and mud to make things slippery and explosive mines that can do all sorts of damage to your ride. Much like yourself, your opponents have weapons and they use them often. Get a few behind you and they can mess you up pronto. There is a pit stop that you have the option to use that both recharges your weapons and repairs all the damage you've taken. Unlike a lot of racing titles, this actually is extremely helpful because you can choose how long you stay. If you find yourself in a heated race, you can stay just a few seconds and give you just enough for that final lap. Gameplay itself isn't particularly responsive and you'll spend more time riding the rails than you want but it isn't bad enough to throw up your hands in disgust. The graphics are, in a word, incredible. I need you to take a step back in time with me to 1993. Think about the games that were available to you at the time. Star Fox and its flat-shaded polygons had shown up for console, Doom was on the PC, and Virtua Fighter had just hit the arcade scene. Yet here was a fully textured mapped racing game with a polygon draw distance from the gods at home. I mean, it's easy to pick it apart retroactively, but this was nearly two years before the Saturn and PlayStation really got things jumping in North America. 
The tracks are designed with lots of hills and valleys that really make it feel like you are zipping around an amusement park ride. The incredible thing is you'll almost never see anything pop up or draw in. No matter where you are, the scene is rendered in its entirety. There's also a few things here that are really impressive in hindsight. There are entire tracks that are transparent. Similar to the stuff you'd see in Sonic R and Mario Kart years later, you have polygon roadways you can completely see through. As impressive as this was back then, it does have a few things that are kind of rough. The performance in this one is well under 30 frames per second and hovers right around the almost unpleasantly choppy mark. There's also an issue with your vehicle being 2D against a 3D polygon track. This wouldn't be so bad except the other cars are made of polygons, making yours stick out like a sore thumb. You do get two viewpoints to race from should it bother you. There's also a heck of an annoying screen effect when you bump another car. It momentarily inverts all the colors and that quickly grows tiresome. The sound and music here is fairly well done. It's the kind of rock techno hybrid you'd expect for the theme and setting. I mentioned earlier that this game isn't perfect and it's not by a long shot. The gameplay is serviceable fun, but isn't anything particularly special. The previously mentioned water and mud on the track keeps things slick, and you'll have to feather the hell out of the gas pedal to navigate it successfully. That's right, this one doesn't have a dedicated brake at all. Letting off the gas immediately slows you down as if a brake button is being pressed, and that's the strategy you'll need to master to do well. I also don't care for the mandatory ads for other games that Crystal Dynamics forces on you every single time the game boots, or you choose to quit a race. I mean, if it were something you manually chose during the title screen, that'd be one thing, but seeing it so often is a real put-off. I also hate a few of the full-screen effects from weapons like the Flashbang. It just fills the screen with a full white image for seconds at a time. It's a cheap effect that really waters down the presentation. I can't really direct a lot of criticism to this overall, however. There were no perfect blueprints for polygon-based car combat games at this point. It was the wild west of console 3D development, and Crystal Dynamics made something that was cohesive enough to be fun and enjoyable at the time. Of course, a few years later, stuff like Twisted Metal and Wipeout would come along and do some great things. But again, you really need to consider the time period to get an accurate idea of what this title was up against. It carried the weight of a $700 console on its shoulders, and that's a hell of a burden to bear no matter the game. Looking back on Crash and Burn today, I find myself still impressed by it in many ways. Like most early 3D games, that graphics engine hasn't aged all that gracefully, but you can still see the bits and pieces that it did get right. It also has a hilariously bad video presentation, complete with clips of really bad actors. I mean, these people easily make the Resident Evil cast look Godfather caliber, and their before race clips are must watch viewing. One of the biggest problems when looking back on a launch title is that later games completely overshadow it. The 3DO was the platform that gave us Road Rash and Need for Speed, and they command the lion's share of attention. Heck, the 3DO itself has always been on the short end of the stick when it comes to comparisons with later released 5th generation machines. There was often a better received version elsewhere with a more competent graphics engine. That wasn't the case here. Crash and Burn was only released on the 3DO and was well before the likes of Daytona USA and Ridge Racer at home. It was one of the precursors of an entire console generation that most people didn't see until much, much later, and that definitely affords it some leeway and respect. Despite its simple gameplay, I had a blast with it as a kid. 
it got enough right to be a great pack-in game, and it held me over for a while until I was able to get more impressive software. If you are a 3DO owner today, this one is easy to find and add to your collection because it's so inexpensive. Most of the pack-in versions are around $30 or so. There was a standalone long box release of it after it stopped being a pack-in and other models of the 3DO became available. That version is much more rare and often sells upwards of $400 or more. Crash and Burn has the unfair position of being looked at by modern audiences as if it came out at the same time as other games that look, run, and play better. That's like comparing Winning Run to Virtual Racing and giving all the credit to the latter despite the trail blazed by the former. I won't try and sell you on Crash and Burn being some great piece of gaming history, it's certainly not, but I can tell you for a pack-in title during a paradigm shift in software development, it wasn't a bad game at all. I'm SegaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.